Jewish geography. Um, right. Anyway, is a list of participants available? Uh, not really for uh, privacy reasons. Um, okay, I'm happy to bring in Galia. So um, hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, we've got 150 people um, and counting. Uh, welcome uh, this evening on May the 24th, an auspicious day because it's my 36th birthday. Um, my name is uh, Lawrence Kazmir. Um, I am one of the fundraising, uh, co uh, fundraising coordinators at the Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel, also known as Chavra uh, Lahagnat Teva. As it says in the name, our mission is to protect Israel's nature and biblical landscapes uh, from uh, unwise development. Um, we have a really great webinar here with uh, Dr. Galia Khanaf Rowi, who I'll introduce in a second. Um, before we start, just a little bit of uh, housekeeping uh, notes. Our website, if you want to find us online, is www.natureisrael.org. You can also find us on Facebook. Um, like and share, please. Um, the power is in our community, so if you know other like-minded people who may be interested in our work, uh, please let them know. Otherwise, I'll never find out. Um, next week, um, our webinar on uh, Friday, on um, Friday, on Sunday, um, is going to be um, about the is going to be celebrating the end of the spring migration with the uh, BirdLife Israel team. So we've got Yonatan Meirav coming back uh, with Dan Alon. I think Alen Kakal is coming and uh, Noah Weiss. Uh, sure, it's going to be fantastic. So don't miss out. On the 14th of June, Amir Balaban will be talking about Swiss, uh, the Western world, the Kotel, uh, Jude uh, Judaism's uh, most holy site. So we'll see how um, the Swiss, so we'll learn how the Swiss and um, religion uh, coexists. And on the 28th of June, um, Noam Weiss will be from uh, the Elapt International Birding Center. We'll be talking about birds as agents of peace. Um, for the, if you missed a webinar or you know someone or you want to share this with someone, you can find uh, all the webinars on www.natureisrael.org slash webinars. Um, invite your friends, families, um, in, and your people in your community. Um, if, you're, if your community wants some co online content, if you're all in lockdown, uh, just send me an email, international at spni.org.il, and we'll be happy to arrange something for you guys. Um, if you're enjoying the webinars and want to show, you, um, uh, give something back and show some support, Go to www.natureisrael.org. There's a donate button uh, in the top right hand corner. Uh, we really appreciate all the dozens of people who've donated uh, generously so far. And if you'd like to join them, that's how you do it. Um, all donations are tax deductible in the UK, the US, and Canada, as well as Israel. And uh, tonight, I'm very proud to introduce uh, Dr. Galia uh, Hanaf Rowi, who is the head of uh, all of our activities in the Greater Tel Aviv area. She's a landscape architect, uh, landscape architect by uh, profession. Um, and now she's working for uh, for us for about what, five years, Galia? What? How many years have you been working for us? For, this is my seventh year. Seventh year, wow. Nearly as long as me. Um, and Galia is in charge of all our activities in Tel Aviv. So that's uh, planning, nature protection, activities um, for, for local people, uh, work uh, our activities with schools, uh, kindergartens, activists, community uh, community gardens, um, the uh, senior citizens, uh, you name it, Galia is in charge. And uh, Galia, please take it away. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lawrence, and happy birthday. Thank you. Special day for you. <laughs> um, then good evening to everyone. I'm really glad uh, to be uh, able to present and to speak to all of you. Uh, I'll tell you a few words about myself and about uh, the Tel Aviv metropolitan area community and what we do. And uh, we actually work with 14 municipalities in the area and we lead an array of activities in uh, education and nature preservation and uh, working with local residents, planning, residents forum, community gardens, and many other activities. Um, one of the issues that is very crucial to the urban well-being, especially in our area, which, which is so dense and populated, are the green infrastructures of trees. Because some places, it's the only nature left in the close area and people seem to be very concerned by trees and have a very personal attachment to them culturally and historically and as part of their uh, well-being. 
Uh, in this lecture tonight, I would like to explore the importance of trees and our duty to preserve them. So I will be talking at first about trees in general, and then uh, about planning issues in the cities and how we can really protect trees and how we can advance more planting of trees and things that happen around the world and specifically what we do in Tel Aviv in the SPNI to help uh, trees exist. So from the very beginning of human culture, the trees are an important role in well, the well-being and the wisdom and the inner peace of man and our understanding of the world. The tree of knowledge that you see here on the right in the biblical story of Adam and Eve represents the temptation for divine knowledge and man's growth into self-dependence um, as a consequence of tasting the divine fruit. So it, this, this uh, we see in many different cultures. And on the left, we see Buddha or Siddhartha Gautama, who was known to establish the Buddhist doctrine, sitting under a ficus tree, um, a divine ficus tree, which is called, that specific type is called the divine ficus tree. And it became the symbol of a spiritual journey of enlightenment, the sitting under the tree. And on the bottom, we see Newton reaching his understanding of the physics of gravity by watching an apple fall from the tree. And these are just a few examples of the many cultural, uh, historical, spiritual examples that trees uh, take part in our life. It's interesting that in uh, some places like the tribes in Indonesia, the Turja tribes, the tree itself is a burial site for the children uh, of, of the Turja tribe, which are buried inside holes in the tree. And they believe that as the tree knows how to heal itself, the soul of the infants becomes one of the tree and goes up with the tree into the, into the sky. And on the left, you see here the remains of those infants in, in, uh, in those trees. Uh, in the last few years, scientists witnessed a phenomenon which changed the whole conception of trees. We, we can't look at a tree as a single object on its own because now it has been discovered that trees communicate between each other. And Susan Simard, who's a Canadian, I see there's uh, quite a few Canadians here listening tonight, so you, you must have heard of uh, Susan Simard. She's a scientist who wrote a book uh, called The Hidden Lives of Trees and done a lot of research on the subject. And she found um, trees to be able to take care of each other and to provide their offspring with carbon and provide other species of trees that are uh, in times of stress with, with carbon and also a whole network of information about uh, pests and threats and so on that goes into the forest. And we can look at the forest as a whole uh, web of information. And this is done by the mycorrhizal uh, fungi, kind of mushrooms, as you see in the bottom part of uh, the presentation here that the roots of the trees connect by the arms of the fungi and the mycorrhizia uh, networks and the information goes in that way to very, very long distances. So I think that's quite a, an astounding new finding that changes the whole way we look at trees. Uh, lately, of course, with the whole COVID-19 virus, uh, a lot of our thoughts were put into how we keep ourselves healthy and our environment healthy. I'm not uh, talking only about the, in Israel, we were allowed to go for, for quite a, a few weeks or even over a month, only 100 meters from our house. And whoever had a tree-lined street and places to go out with trees, had a whole different life experience than people who lived in areas bare of trees. But aside for that, from that, uh, recently uh, Japanese scientists found that exposure to forest environments can enhance the human uh, immune system and actually produce more NK, natural killer cells in humans, 
And these cells are, are the front of our, um, of our immune system, and they are responsible for fighting viruses and also fighting uh, cancer cells. So these scientists took the workers of what is maybe the SPNI of Japan and the, the workers of the forest and compared it to um, that of people who, who sit in, in the offices and saw that the amount of NK cells in the forest year's blood was way higher than the people who were in the offices. But then they also decided to take uh, people who went into a five day and night uh, exploration in the forest and to see if that made the NK cells uh, higher in numbers in their immune system and they found out that it definitely did. So this is a very kind of a recent research that also makes us think differently of, uh, of trees. Um, trees are known to be the lungs of the world and the amount of trees being cut down every year in the Amazon forest and, and many other places is tremendous. And its effects are much wider than that local place where they were cut down. It's, it's, uh, the effect is global. And if we look at Brazil, then uh, almost uh, 10,000 square kilometers were cut down in 2019. And that's 30% more than 2018, the, year, the previous year. And trees are being cut down mainly to grow corn and soy and other things to feed animals for the meat industry. So as I said, trees are the lungs of the world and um, they really are the best thing that can happen to our air. They're the best air purifiers we have. Uh, they reduce secondary air pollutants such as ozone. And one tree, one large tree, full grown, I'm talking about 60, 70, 80 year old tree absorbs 20 ton of carbon and provides us with 700 kilograms of oxygen in one year. So multiply that by the amount of trees in a, in a city. Uh, it, it's very, very important. And one grown tree can also clean and purify 100,000 cubic meter of polluted air in one year. So there's uh, if, if you look on the left, it says every day I supply oxygen for up to four people. Don't you think I'm worth saving? And other uh, kind of uh, pictures like this saying that uh, it's, it's a miracle what trees can do, but they're free. So nobody even thinks about it as, as, as a supply that they give to humans because we don't pay for it. Uh, another very important role of trees is uh, mitigating erosion and earthquake damage. Um, the roots of trees are the main supporters of the topsoil. The topsoil is the top of the soil and it's considered to be gold in many ways because all the organic matter that really helps to grow and things is in the topsoil. And what holds the topsoil in times of floods and rains are roots of trees and roots of plants because otherwise things, as you see on the picture here on the left, things are, uh, the topsoil goes with the flood and we lose all the good organic matter. So um, the roots help slow down the water floods and capture the water. And the most important thing is that they know how to infiltrate the water into the ground water. And uh, in places around the equator, they also manage to um, withstand huge uh, winds and so on. If, if you know the mangroves uh, that help to really reduce the damage of the tsunamis and were all taken down to make nice tourist beaches, but now governments are putting millions of dollars back into planting the mangroves again so they can hold uh, the water from the one side and the soil from the other side uh, in times of, of stress. Uh, the roots of the trees not only hold the soil and infiltrate the water, they also know how to purify 
the water. And that's very, very important because the roots of trees can absorb uh, pollutants and they're excellent filters and they can purify very heavy pollution, including metals, sewage, organic waste such as nitrogen and phosphorus, and actually bring it back to drinking water quality. And when water filtrates through tree roots into the groundwater, it, it is also purified. And then instead of losing this water, we actually get it back in groundwater, uh, which uh, is, is part of our drinking water system in Israel. Um, oh, it, it came upside down here, but it says uh, rain gardens and tree holes in Portland, Oregon. And we see how in Oregon and many other places in the world, uh, municipalities and cities have realized that instead of taking all the water and uh, pushing it to the main uh, uh, system, to the drainage system, to the sea and transport it to sunken tree holes that they make. If you see the, the small, uh, in the middle, of the page here, we see the, a small connection between the street and the tree hole and a rain garden. And the water goes there and infiltrates and cleans, is being cleaned by the roots of these trees and goes back to groundwater instead of being transported to the sea and getting lost. Uh, very good, pure rainwater, which we lose completely. So trees, I mentioned already a few things but, uh, that are, are connected to climate change, but uh, trees are really able to m mitigate climate change because they produce a microclimate that is especially important in cities where we have something called the urban heat island in which the asphalt and the roofs and all the built area of, air, of, of urban areas makes these places uh, with four to five temperatures higher than their surroundings. And trees and shaded areas and big trees like the one we see here on the left are very, very uh, important to make a microclimate, to reduce the heat, to mitigate the wind effects. And they also, when they are in a tree-lined street close to houses, they reduce the need for air conditioning and for, he for heating because they produce a microclimate of their own and that, of course, has an effect on carbon release and use of uh, electricity and so on. So on a very interesting research done by Oded Pochter, uh, Israeli uh, researcher, scientist in, in Tel Aviv University, he compared, he, uh, this is from 1997, but he's been doing it ever since in many other places other than Tel Aviv, and he he took here four different streets. Two of them were tree-lined, like we, the one we see on the right, and two of them were kind of bare from real significant trees. They have tiny trees that will hardly grow because they have a meter on meter uh, planting pot. Uh, and he saw that at different times of the day, as you see in the graph, it's the different times of the day and the different temperature, there can be almost a five degree Celsius difference between a tree-lined street and a bare street. So trees provide shade and in the urban context, that's very, very important because in Israel where we have six months of a very hot summer and we have a lot of bare areas in these cities, people cannot walk or bike or do anything in a place where uh, there's no shade. So if you want a walkable city and, uh, and a sustainable city that has uh, bikes and less cars on the, on the roads and, and more um, shops that are open and, and people uh, have a community interaction and so on, this happens on a good street. And a good street is a tree-lined street with shade and it reduces the damage of the, the sun radiation. Another thing that trees are very, very important, and especially in the SPNI, we deal a lot with this subject, is that trees are actually in some cities where we have very little urban nature, trees are the urban nature, the infrastructure of trees and, and whole areas lined with trees provide 
a habitat for reptiles, bats, birds, bugs, fungi, butterflies, and more, as you see here in the pictures. Uh, and they, one tree can hold hundreds of different species. And uh, this is very, very uh, important, not only to plant trees in cities, but also to plant them in a, in a way that they will provide a whole green line of trees that the, the different uh, animals and the biodiversity can be complete and whole and not only on, be on a one single tree. Trees are also used wisely by planners to uh, reduce noise and to reduce uh, aesthetic uh, problems and so on. As you hear, you see in the, in the graph, you see the buffer from the highway to the neighborhood with the trees and it. They are very effective. They are sometimes much more effective than, than these acoustic walls that are very ugly and being built uh, everywhere. So trees, it's specific trees with dense foliage like cypresses can really absorb noise. And of course, what well, we all know that it contributes widely to the aesthetic of, our, of our, our cities, the amount of color we have in the tree, not only in the fruits and in the flowers, but in the leaves themselves. And we see the different seasons and uh, we actually have uh, smells and, uh, and beauty and so on. And we can also cover up uh, urban uh, neglect and damages in the city with uh, some nice trees. So when we put all this together and we look at even real uh, money value uh, recently and, and real estate value can rise up to 27% in the tree line street. Here we have uh, Ulifant Street on the right in Tel Aviv, which is a beautiful shaded street. And Ibn Gavirol Street, which is one of the main streets in, uh, in, in, in Frischmann Street, which are, have only palm trees in the middle, if you can see, and they don't give any shade and they don't really give much to, to anything when we're talking about the biodiversity and shade and, and uh, air pollutants and so on. So this all can translate into money. And it also, there's much research that shows that trees improve health, decrease the crime rate, and have a positive effect on mood. Um, and of course, it's something we all intuitively know, but now research comes and backs it up with numbers and, and so on. So I want to talk about um, another aspect of the importance of a tree after all, um, these uh, things that I've talked about, and to look at the tree as a place. And uh, if you look at this uh, uh, Baobab uh, tree in Africa, where you can see almost the whole village can stand around these tremendous, beautiful uh, trees. And I want to read you a beautiful passage from a very important article uh, called The Tragedy of the Commons, uh, The Reclaiming the Commons and the Hidden Commons by J Jonathan Rowe from 2001. Um, he, I'll, I'll read you a, a bit of it. My wife grew up in what Western experts call, now not without condescension, a developing country. The social life of her village revolved largely around trees. People gathered there and in the evening to visit, tell stories, pass the time. Some of my wife's warmest childhood memories are of playing hide and seek late into the evening while the parents chatted under the tree or the neighborhood porch, which was another version of the same thing. The tree was more than a quaint meeting place. It was a productive asset, an economic asset in the root sense of the world. It produced a bonding of neighbors, an information network, an activity center for kids who ran and played and invented their games, a bridge between generations. Older people could be part of the flow of daily life and children got to experience something scarce in the US today, an unstructured and non-competitive setting in which their parents are close at hand. 
And I, I love that passage. I, I very, it really touches my heart every time. And I think it's a very true thing. I think a lot of us remember from our childhood that uh, sitting under the tree in such a situation was something very, very common that we see less and less uh, today. And we need to preserve it. And what he continues and says is that today the tree is cut down and everything is it gave us, we buy with money today. We make a community center and we make a TV and we make the games and we make all kinds of things that cost us a lot of money instead of what we had there naturally in that beauty of a real, a real beautiful full grown tree. Um, so I, I see I have, Okay, so um, the economic value that he's talking about is something that we could translate and, and we could turn it into dollar sums and maybe that's a way to convince uh, the government and whoever has to make the decisions that uh, trees are worthwhile. Uh, because if you look a few facts, like uh, correct distribution of trees around the building, can reduce energy, as I said before, and cool heating by 20 to 50 percent and cooling. Uh, the real estate value that goes up, the economic value in the tree adds up to millions of dollars. So when we sum it up, uh, all the different th things I've said already, we can really see that we can translate it into, into money. This is a specific translation of a certain tree uh, made in India, but one tree that cleans and purifies 100,000 cubic meter of air is $62,000 a year. One tree that produces such and such oxygen is $31,000 a year. I'm not sure that sums are exact here uh, and right for every place, but we do see how the economic value can really add up. So if I sum up everything I've talked about until now, then we have, we can, categorize it in different kinds of categories of benefits of trees. We have the health benefits, mental and physical health and immune system and so on. We have the social benefits that have an effect on social and cultural leisure, vacation and so on. As I read uh, that uh, Jonathan Rose uh, words, and the aesthetic benefits, the landscaping, the texture, density, seasons, the viewpoints, covering hazards, and so on. We have the climate and environmental benefits, reducing urban heat islands, reducing flood damage, temperature, improving air quality, the ecological benefits of the biological biodiversity, and the economic benefits, which if we take everything together, it reduces energy use, improves real estate values, reduces health costs, and so on. Um, just one word, I want to go back to, the, to one word that uh, I skipped here, which is very important, and SPNI works a lot in this area. Everything I've talked about now is 100% true in urban areas and in cities, but we have to be very careful about tree as a solution, a worldwide solution in open space, because when you plant a lot of trees in an area, which is bare of trees and is supposed to be that way, that's the ecological system like a desert. Uh, you change the ecosystem and you change the biodiversity and you interrupt natural habitats, which isn't a good thing. So we have to be very uh, careful and delicate about choosing where to plant trees, how many trees and have them be the right trees for the right areas. So that's just something that I wanted to uh, to say here and to really point out that most of what I'm saying today has to do with urban context. So now I would really uh, want to talk about silent trees, the connection between tree protection community and city planning. What I mean that trees now, as you see in the presentation, this tree has a mouth, but most of them don't. And we are actually here to protect the trees and to speak for them and to be the ones advocating to help them survive everything that's going on. 
Uh, so what are the major threats to the urban forest, to trees in the urban area? So people think it's tree uprooting, a lot of trees that are being taken down for building and so on. I'll talk about that in a minute. But actually, the most uh, major threat is actually all the rest of the trees, the things done to the tree while it's still alive, the harmful pruning, vandalism. Uh, neglectful or wrong agronomic care and ha harm done to the roots. The tree isn't uprooted, but his roots are harmed by building around and uh, very small planters for trees in the streets and so on. So most trees that die, die from these things. And uh, recently I've been to uh, uh, there was a big uh, day for saving the trees in Israel. Uh, but and, and one after one, people came up to lecture and showed act the reason why their organization is allowed to uproot the trees because it's very important. So there's a million reasons why trees should be uprooted. If it's the JNIF that needs fire buffer zones, and if it's Israeli Nature and Park Authority that uh, fights invasive species such as eucalyptuses, and the electricity company that protects it, electric cables and damaging pruning and uprooting, and the transportation authority that for roads and parking, and the light rail, which is a huge issue now in Tel Aviv area because 10,000 trees are planned to be uprooted because of the light rail, and even though new ones will be planted, they'll be planted in small uh, planting pots and it will take them 40, 50 years to grow and they will never grow to be what the trees that were there before were. So urban renewal and conservation under all these things, underground parking is, is made and, and the trees are, trees are damaged and, and either are uprooted or die as a consequence. So in a city so dense as a metropolitan area of Tel Aviv, where the building is, is exponential, it's growing, if we don't take care of the trees now, our children and grandchildren will have no trees at all on the streets. And that will be uh, with the urban heat island and everything I've talked about, that will be a true, true damage to the quality of life. So even if we look at conservation, these are beautiful conserved buildings in Tel Aviv. These are the exceptions because we see the trees as part of the history of the building in these two pictures and the trees were preserved. But most buildings, we have a thousand buildings in Tel Aviv that are considered to be part of the conservation plan. Most of them didn't keep the trees as part of the history and the culture and all that. And they built underground parking lots that damage the tree roots. And I'll show some very sad example in a few minutes. And we at the SPNI at the Tel Aviv branch, we did um, uh, kind of a survey about tree planting uh, and tree uprooting. And we saw that in Tel Aviv in the years between 2011 and 17, if you look, the blue is uprooting of tree and the green is uh, planting of new trees. And the brown is moving the tree which is a procedure that usually 50% of the time doesn't really work. So uh, as you see, the number of uprooting goes up and up and up and the number of planting stays very low. And just during the COVID-19 two months now that uh, uh, everything was closed down, the municipality of Tel Aviv uprooted 216 trees. So this is a very, very big problem in Tel Aviv that we are working a lot with the public to uh, help. So a few pictures of damages from building, for harmful care, for damaging the roots and, and making the tree actually fall to one side, uh, unprofessional pruning of trees, and so on. So how can we save the trees from urban planning? We need to think creatively instead of being just an engineer drawing a line on the page and taking the tree down without even seeing it. So as you see in this beautiful picture, I love this picture, uh, we see how you can curve a road to keep a tree. 
And these are also some beautiful creative solutions, which I think also give uh, much to the residents in this house where, where the tree was preserved. This is a beautiful one, I love it. The tree growing into the living room of the house. So uh, another way we work in SBNI to help promote uh, saving the trees is doing tree surveys that provide detailed documentation of special trees. This one is from Jerusalem. And also the Ministry of Agriculture has an application for mapping trees. This is what it looks like in general, the tree survey. It gives a lot of information about the important trees. And then when planners come to do uh, a plan, they can first see what the important trees are and plan around them and not instead of them and not take them down. Another way is called the UTC, the Urban Tree Canopy Survey that doesn't look at the individual tree, but looks at a city and where its foliage is dense and where it isn't. So we can also do environmental justice and see that like in Tel Aviv, the southern neighborhoods hardly have trees, while the northern neighborhoods have plenty of trees in the Yarkon Park and so on. And Tel Aviv considers itself to be one of the best cities with a lot of trees, but it's not actually true. It's in certain areas of the city. So lastly, I would like to show uh, a few cities that have taken this thing very seriously and made uh, a real plan, a real strategic plan for, um, for the importance of the urban forest. So, um, here we see um, we see different. This is a million trees in New York City. This was a uh, a plan made to plant a million new trees, and um, uh, it was actually completed in uh, I think 2019. And uh, New York City has a million new trees in it or the urban forest strategy of Sydney. And I love this uh, quotation they have on the beginning of the strategy. A society grows great when old men plant trees who shade, they know will, they shall never sit in. So um, we also see this in the, the San Francisco urban forestry strategy that, uh, that sets themselves to maximize the benefits of street trees to increase street trees uh, by 50,000 new trees, establish and fund a citywide street tree maintenance program that people actually maintain the, the, the trees in front of their uh, door and manage street trees throughout their entire life cycle. And there are a lot of tree activism around the world because many people feel that the governments and municipalities are not doing enough so we see like the San Francisco Friends of the Urban Forest, which is a group of citizens who made an interactive tree map and they give out free tree tours and tree planting and so on. And they even give out a course for tree uh, urban foresters and people uh, in, in return give 40 days of volunteering. Or the Seattle fruit tree map, I love this one in 2014. Uh, they, they made a map of all the fruit trees that give uh, fruit that nobody collects and they collected a group of citizens from backyards and they got 10 ton of fruit that were donated to 39 food banks, schools and community organizations. So, and in the UK, a group of citizens that joined to make an ancient tree hunt map in all over England, Ireland and Scotland and they mapped over 48,000 trees which were mapped and are very, very important for planning correctly. And this is a beautiful new thing that came out just in the recent weeks in, uh, in Berlin, where people adopt a tree and water it for its whole life cycle and get in from interactive information about the tree that they adopted. And it shows up on a map of Berlin. So also in our SPNI uh, Tel Aviv branch, we, has, we have a tree trustees forum 
that for a few years we were giving out courses to people about trees, about the importance of trees, about how to preserve them, about all kinds of uh, uh, different issues. And they were our eyes and our uh, people who went out and really saw what's going on in the streets, went into the municipality websites to see what trees are planned to be uprooted and so on. And uh, we have done a few major things in the last few years. This is one of our recent uh, battles, one, together with the citizens in this Derot Yerushalayim, which are the big boulevards in Jaffa, which have 80-year-old uh, ficus trees that were supposed to be cut down because of the light rail. And we actually, with a group of citizens, we put up signs about the death of the tree, as you see here on the left, and uh, warned people and made tours that citizens themselves from Jaffa led about the trees. Uh, the oranges are fake. Uh, this is a ficus tree, not an orange tree. And actually came up with, uh, with a new plan that we gave to the light rail company, how we could save the trees and all the trees were saved. So that was a big uh, victory for us. But the sad story is another story of a five, 100-year-old ficus tree destroyed by urban renewal plans. Uh, as you see, what they did is they dug the parking lots close to the trees. You see how close to the roots it is. And the tree just recently, a week ago, which is about a year after the building, uh, fell down, as we see, uh, as we see here. So there are solutions for that that costs more and we can make parking lots which are much more deep and cost more and not uh, damage the tree roots. And we can also plant new trees in a way where they can actually grow, as you see here on the left, not in a small pothole, but in the area where they have uh, really a way to expand their roots. So I would like to conclude with a very touching uh, quote from Ben Gurion's speech in 1962, when he brought up the law for nature reserves and parks. A 70 year old tree, which is uprooted, cannot be replaced by any new building. There is no compensation for an antique tree. The destructor of such tree is a destructor of human roots. There's no building or electricity pole more important than an old eucalyptus tree, an old ficus or an old oak forest. They are the root of man. A building you can build here or there, but a hundred year old tree has no replacement. It's not only vandalism, but the destruction of the future. It is always found that a tree is disturbing someone of something, a straight line of the sidewalk or an electric cable or some small roundabout which someone planned with his short sighted imagination. And this is from 1962. If he would have seen what is going on today, I think uh, it would, would have been very, very uh, sad. So um, thank you for being with me uh, tonight. And uh, there's really a lot of work to do and we are working hard, especially after these days of, uh, of the COVID-19. We had to uh, let a lot of our very young people uh, on vacation and we our work and everything we can do in, in preserving trees and nature in the urban context and everywhere in Israel. Thank you very much. And we'll have time for questions if there are any questions. Um, thank you so much, Kadia. That was both fascinating and tragic, really. Like I, I, I was really uh, intrigued by the topic, but came out of, you know, I feel now very, very down um, about it. And uh, as Gary was, say was saying, um, you know, SBNI, the Society for Protection of Nature in Israel, we've been really, um, really hit uh, hard by the coronavirus. Um, and the vast majority of our income come from uh, our tourism, self-generated activities, um, which are no longer running. And we've uh, lost uh, several million shakal, uh, probably into, into double figures now since uh, since March and uh, sadly one of the uh, some of the one of the programs which has been cut as is our work in the cities like in Tel Aviv so all this work to uh, protect uh, trees 
unfortunately that's one of the things that's been cut so if you can help please make a donation now please go to www.natoisrael.org um, you'll see the donate button in the top right hand corner and please make a donation if you want to if you um, care about um, trees in Israel about seeing uh, making sure that our cities are habitable that we can go out and walk in the heat please please make a donation now um, I know that Tu is uh, in January and normally the time that people um, donate um, to plant trees uh, but we ask you now please donate now so we can uh, protect the trees that are currently existing and uh, we don't need for we don't need uh, new forests we need exist we need urban forests which currently exist we need to protect the trees that we have so please again uh, www.natureisrael.org and uh, donate as generously as you can um, again uh, uh, donations are tax deductible in the UK uh, US and Canada and Israel um, Galia thank you so much and um, on to the questions um, so I think um, the first question, which was asked quite early on, can you say a bit more about um, about how the trees communicate with, with each other? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, now you've unmuted yourself, yes. Oh, okay. So what was the question again? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's, uh, how do the trees actually communicate with each other? They're, like, um, I was quite interested by that. And okay, got that, yeah, that, it's fascinating. I've been trying to read the scientific uh, articles uh, and, and I really, whoever's interested should, should read them. But from what I understand, it's the mycorrhizal fungi have a whole web of, it's like these long, long arms like our nerve system that go underground in the soil and they connect from one tree root to another tree root, not even some, not of the same species. And so Susan Simmer, the researcher, found that certain kinds of trees connect with certain other kinds of trees and that they have a whole web system underground that uh, provide inst information about the amounts of carbon, about the amounts of water, about different stress and they, they actually, through the mycorrhizia, uh, transfer uh, carbon and food to each other. And to, they can even recognize their own sibling, uh, their own seedlings. Oh, wow. Uh, and they know which one are their own, and they can provide them with food underground. Wow. That's amazing. It's fascinating, yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. I never knew trees were so interesting. Um, so someone asked, oh, Galia asked, no, no, uh, were, was Israel originally covered with trees in biblical times? What? Was, was Israel originally covered with trees in biblical times? Uh, Israel wasn't covered with trees. I mean, there were some areas that are in Israel is a, is a very diverse area. It still is today and was always because it's the, the meeting place of three continents. And so... We've had deserts. We know in the Bible we've had deserts, and the Sinai Desert, of course, wasn't covered with trees. And uh, and the trees were different. Some of the trees were different trees. Some of the trees we know were here from biblical times, um, and are mentioned in the Bible. But some are new trees. There weren't any eucalyptuses here in the Bible times, but there certainly were olive trees and and oak trees and. Uh, and others that are very specific to the Israeli climate and have survived since. Fair enough. Um, I, I can see in the chat that and um, there was a question a bit earlier. Can you share this session with other people? The answer is yes, please share this session. Um, the recording will be available uh, sometime tomorrow uh, on www.natureisrael.org slash webinars. Um, so yeah, please share it. Uh, someone's asking about if they could share with their um, uh, one of their, their urban gardening groups in America. So yes, please do. Um, there's another question. What are the most popular uh, common trees in Israel? The most popular trees. Common, well, no, I'm common not trees. sure I'll be able to, to, uh, to say the names in, in English, but uh, the question, first of all, is if you're talking about urban trees or natural area trees. If you see in natural areas, we mostly have the the oak tree and the ela tree, which I don't know the name in English, unfortunately, and the olive trees, and um, well, it's hard for I, I'm I By, guess, the, the, um, all the ones in the Bible, like a good um, 
a good uh, are like a good guide. Um, I also confess trees are not really my specialist subject either. Um, I was going to say, I, of course, um, obviously my favorite tree story in the Bible is Elisha and the and the bear, where he met, where he where according to some uh, uh, rabbis, uh, the Talmud, that he makes the forest appear out of nowhere for the bears to come from. Um, but no one wants to hear from me. They want to hear from Galia. Um, so Galia, um, so Michael asks, what is um, what's it like um, in the autumn, in the fall in Israel? Do we have like lots? Of, do we have like the the, the 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 leaves turning orange and brown? Or, no, uh, actually, in Israel, um, we almost don't have autumn here. We have summer and winter, and a very short autumn and a very short spring. Um, we do have trees, deciduous trees, where uh, all the leaves um, fall in the autumn uh, genetically. It's in, in the kind of that tree, and it's mostly we find those trees up north in the cooler areas. And of course, in fruit trees like prunes and, uh, and so on, that, uh, and cherry trees and uh, so, so on. But uh, most of the trees in Israel have leaves year long that they, they change year long. Of course, the leaves fall, but no one grows all the time. And we do have uh, what's called half deciduous trees that they, it's not genetic, but if it's very cold, they'll lose their leaves. And if it isn't, they won't. And during the years, we see that more and more trees don't lose their uh, leaves with climate change. And that's uh, interesting. Um, I've been told that the, the tree that Galia was mentioning before is the pistachio uh, tree. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little birdie. Um, thank you. Um, so someone uh, in Facebook, um, we, you can see this live on Facebook, uh, ask, uh, says, I live near Kika Hamadina, which is in Tel Aviv, uh, which is no longer a park area um, compared to what it was. There's very little green space in Tel Aviv. Do you see any positive progress in this area? Uh, well, it's a very sad story with Kitam Dina. There were 30 very old uh, ficus trees, shikma, which are the kind of the trees of Tel Aviv. It's a kind of a fig tree. Uh, and they were being uprooted and transferred twice and will apparently been, be uh, planted again back when that whole area is, they're building three very big uh, uh, apartment buildings there and they'll be planted back, but I really don't believe they will survive two uprootings and planting back, at least not most of them. Uh, of course, new trees will be planted, but it will all be above a big parking lot that's underneath the whole Kikaram Dina. And again, they will hardly have a place for their roots and they will, won't grow to be a full grown tree with shade and so on. Um, that is very sad. Um, someone, uh, Barbara asked, um, are the sinkholes near the Dead Sea due to a lack of tree roots? No, the sinkholes, the, the area of the Dead Sea, the soil does not let hardly any any trees or any other vegetation grow because it's so salty and dry and so uh that is due to the water pumping from the dead sea which takes out the salt water and then the sweet water goes in underground and makes these very big sinkholes and then that's what makes this um yeah. This happened. Yeah. Okay. Um, so an anonymous uh, attendee said, uh, please talk about how the eucalyptus trees got to Israel. Well, the eucalyptus trees were brought from Australia and a uh, hundred years ago or so. And one of the things they were thought to do is be able to dry up the swamps because eucalyptus is can drink a lot of water. They can also survive in dry conditions, but they can also drink a lot of water. Uh, that, that's been proven not to be true. And uh, the, the swamps were dried in, in many other ways and have been found to be a big mistake when we're talking about uh, 
the, from the ecological side. And as you know, the Hula swamp was brought back and, and it's, a, it's one of the most important places for nature and birds in the world uh, today. But uh, that's how the eucalyptuses were brought today. They're considered um, uh, invasive species because in, the, in Israel, in Australia, maybe they behave different, but in Israel, they can seed themselves and, and spread themselves in a way which is, uh, takes over ecological, uh, local ecological areas and plants. And there's a big debate about that because they are very beautiful trees, very big, give a lot of shade, mostly in the parks we have a lot of eucalyptuses, but they are problematic. And another problem they have is that their leaves are allopathic, which means that they have that uh, etheric uh, oil in them that doesn't let other plants grow underneath it. So it's a problematic, beautiful tree. That sounds like my life, having married a problematic, beautiful wife. You can't hear me, so it's perfect. Um, so I've been, uh, so okay, another question says uh, from Neil again, uh, here in the Eastern US, hemlock trees have been under attack by an Asian insect. Do we have similar threats from invasive species in Israel? Uh, from insects? I, I didn't hear or the question. other invasive species um, eating trees, um, so like killing trees, like through viruses or insects out of control. Yes, yes, we have had uh, we have a terrible problem with uh, palm trees. We had, uh, uh, it's called in Hebrew, I don't know how it's called in English. It's a little bug that goes into the trunk of the palm tree and you see nothing on the outside and one day the whole palm tree just falls down and hundreds and of trees all over just started falling down and it's very 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 dangerous and so the city of Tel Aviv uh, gave and there's actually an immune shot that you can give the trees but they only gave it to the trees in the public space and they didn't, didn't give it to the trees in the private space. So those all fell down and were got sick. And, and, and today there's a big uh, problem with planting uh, palm trees because of this. Okay. Um, Michael asks, are cedar trees still growing in Israel? Are cedar trees still, still growing in Israel? Yes, yes. Uh, especially in, uh, in the cooler areas of the Hermon. Awesome. Um, okay, so we're, we're going to have the last few questions before wrapping up. Um, thank you to everyone uh, who's still with us. Um, Rabbi Cantor uh, asks, is Israel, oh no, it's moved. Uh, is Israel still unique among developed countries uh, for increasing uh, the amount of trees in our country, which uh, was a very uh, JNF um, uh, fun fact about Israel from uh, when I was growing up? Well, there's a big problem with the planting of the JNF in Israel because it's not uh, ecologically sustainable planting. Uh, the JNF for many years planted many, many pine trees in areas which didn't have pine trees and they completely got rid of all the local vegetation and the local ecology. And these pine trees don't hold more than 80, 90 years. And they also have a, a allelopathic problem that the pine uh, uh, needles don't allow anything to grow underneath. So th there was a lot of tree planting, but it wasn't done in a smart way. And so today the whole vision is very different. We, we believe that if we let the trees grow in themselves in the natural areas, like after the big fire in the Haifa area in the Carmel, instead of planting trees, they just took care of the seedlings that grew themselves and planted maybe local trees and vegetations which are uh, ecologically sustainable. Okay, um, Russell asked, um, can you uh, can you give an update from uh, from what's happened down south after all the arson attacks, um, probably about eighteen months ago? Uh, all the, all the fire bombings uh, from Hamas uh, coming out from Gaza. Well, those areas were mostly uh, agricultural areas, uh, not only, but a lot of agricultural areas where there were less 
like forests or trees uh, in, in that sense, but like in every place, there is a fire, it does a lot of damage and it's very painful. But in a way, fires have always been nature's way to heal itself. In a way, a fire is part of an ecological system. Here, of course, it's a terror attack and it was something else, but nature does know how to recover well from a fire if you let it happen. Okay. So, um, Yes, we, we can see that in Australia as well after the wildfires, um, that it just, you know, fire is part of the natural system and uh, it's like the phoenix from the flames, that uh, life just comes back because that's how it evolved. Um, thank you everyone very much for all your kind um, words. Um, I, I'm just trying to see if there's one, there is one more question I want to ask you, Galia, if that is okay, uh, if I can find it again. Um, so Gabrielle asks, Urban Resource Institute partners with the city of New Haven, Connecticut to enlist tree adopters, i.e. the city pays for the trees and planting and, uh, and the planting and the volunteers agree to water their trees. Um, do we have that type of program in Israel? Uh, no, we don't. I showed actually that in Berlin they were doing something very similar and a few other places like in, in, in London, they have Trees for Cities that does that kind of a work, beautiful organizations. Mm -hmm. And in Israel, unfortunately, uh, we don't have that. We, we mostly have uh, uh, a battle between the citizens and the, the municipalities. And uh, the SPNI is working very hard to make municipalities uh, realize that people can take part in this and can help and can do a lot of the maintenance and the work and be the eyes of the trees to see that they're not damaged and, uh, and we can all work together around that. And it's part of, very, very important part of what we are trying to do in, in the urban areas. Okay, well, uh, I think that's, that'll be the last question for today. Um, Galia, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, everyone is saying in the chat how much is a great presentation and they've learned uh, so much. Um, remember, everyone, next week we'll be back uh, on Sunday, uh, same time, uh, same uh, place, but probably a different Zoom uh, webinar password um, for, uh, for a webinar with the birders um, celebrating the end of the spring migration. Um, again, um, we really um, need your support at this time. We really, really appreciate it um, to donate. Yeah. yeah. Uh, someone is asking for you to give the website again because the site does not have a place to donate. Oh, it, it definitely does. But the website is www.natureisrael.org. Um, um, okay, I'll have a look in Sarah. I'll have a look why our, webs why our donations aren't working. Um, and in the top right corner, there's the donate button. Um, again, um, if I don't see any of you before, um, before next week, Chag Sameach, it's uh, Shavuot. Um, my, uh, apparently I have, I've just moved house and I have a peach tree in my garden and um, apparently my uh, five-year-old uh, son, who I wrote about this week, wants to, um, um, wants to um, tithe the first fruits to give to one of our friends who's a Cohen. So that'll be a fun activity for tomorrow. Um, and uh, yeah, Chag Sameach, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Galia. I'm sure I'll be seeing. I'm sure you. I'll be seeing you soon. Um, and yeah, we'll see you all next week. Have a great week, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.